All right. So hybrid mobile app development. Has anybody done PhoneGap or other sorts of hybrid app? Okay. If you, does anybody not know what PhoneGap is? Maybe I won't. Maybe I'll skim through this a little bit. Um, hybrid mobile apps. Uh, what they are is normally you develop your Android app in Java, your iOS app in Objective C, your Windows Phone app in um, .NET, whatever they use. And um, hybrid mobile apps take away having to build. Uh, developed to all different platforms. You develop it once in one like DSL, one pro programming framework, and it cross compiles to all the major platforms. Um, and in the case of HTML5 based hybrid frameworks, namely PhoneGap, we're going to talk about, uh, one of the big pros here is you get to use JavaScript and HTML. So you're using web development skills so that um, your, your stack is kind of um, using the same language everywhere. Um, those are the pros. You write it once and it builds to all the platforms. The cons are, are performance. Almost invariably, you get substantially less performant app than um, if you were write it native. And the look and feel typically to the keen mobile user, they'll be able to tell the difference between a hybrid mobile app and a native mobile app. So if what you are building is an iOS app, and that's like your primary thing as a business model, uh, you wouldn't want to go the hybrid mobile app approach. But if you want to get to the market, uh, the mobile market fast and reach a wider audience, then hybrid mobile apps is the best bet. And if you want to um, complete kind of the full stack JavaScript cycle. The big contenders in the space fall under two categories. Um, there's the non-HTML5 based ones. And the way these work is you actually write it in the programming language of the framework. So the, um, the only one I'm familiar with by experience is Row Mobile Roads. You write it in Ruby. Um, you write your mobile app in Ruby, kind of like Ruby on Rails, but it's its own MVC. And then it actually builds like the Java version for an iOS, for, for an Android app, and the, uh, the Objective C version for an iOS app. So it actually builds native apps. Um, and it uses like native widgets and everything. Um, the other contenders are Titanium, Corona, Trigger.io. And this is really cool. You're going to get better performance, and you're going to get a better look and feel for a native experience. Um, the HTML5 based one, well, all it does is you write your app as a, as a web app, um, a uh, responsive web app, and you, you package it in this container through PhoneGap, for example, and it then just simply becomes a downloadable app on your mobile device. So it's, that way it actually can um, be developed for many more devices than these non-HTML5 based ones allow for. And you get to reuse all of your standard web development skills. The downside is it's going to be a lot less performant and native feeling than these non-HTML5 based contenders. So there are multiple types, or there are multiple contenders in the HTML5 based hybrid mobile frameworks. One is Cocoon.js. It's kind of getting a lot of attention. I'd recommend checking into it. It's supposed to be more performant than PhoneGap. I don't know. I haven't really looked too much into it. But the biggest one, by and large, is PhoneGap. Um, and uh, it's the biggest of the uh, hybrid mobile app frameworks in general as well. So it's the most popular, it's got the brightest future. And that's what we're going to talk about today because we want JavaScript everywhere. So that's the biggest benefit of using PhoneGap is you get to use your web development skills. In the case of the full stack JavaScript um, circle, um, you get to reuse a lot of your code as well. So J JavaScript everywhere. The way we achieve this at Habit RPG is um, we have a common library that houses all the, sh because it's JavaScript ever everywhere, we have a common library that houses all the JavaScript code that is shared between different platforms. So the server and the client, um, uh, they need the same algorithms and JavaScript functions. And so <clears throat> we have a common library that's, that's used as an NPM module on the server for Express. And then, a bow, and, then, and then the same repository is used as a Bower package on the client. And the way that that works is you use an NPM module called Browserify. This right here. It will, it will, too small, huh? Sorry, guys. Um, Browserify will convert common JS type require um, uh, resolutions into uh, web browser compatible client JS. So it takes one JavaScript file and it makes it available to both server and client. <clears throat> and then we use that same common library on the mobile app 
um, to make those functions, those, those, uh, those features available to the mobile app as well. And the big benefit here is um, our website is our primary property. It's really full-featured. It's, it's a full-fledged MMORPG. The mobile app is kind of secondary. A lot of our developers don't pay, uh, spend a lot of time here. And so what happens is everybody works on the, mobile, on the website, fixing bugs and adding features and stuff. And this byproduct is every few weeks, I'll just do an NPM update on the mobile app and push a new release to the Play Store and the iTunes Connect, and I inherit all these bug fixes and new features just for free. And it's, it's really cool. It saves a lot of time and effort. And in the case of Ionic, because Ionic is um, Angular JS based, I'm also able to put services and directives and templates into that common lib that are shared between the mobile app and the, and the website. So it is kind of the, the holy grail that you know, Java was trying to achieve with write once, run everywhere, finally coming to fruition. So that's hybrid mobile app development. <laughs> once you, um, so, in the case of PhoneGap, PhoneGap is very minimal. All it does is it takes your mobile web app and it packages it as a downloadable uh, app onto the different devices. It also exposes a bunch of um, really cool things like it has a JavaScript API for accessing your device's capabilities like you can use JavaScript to, you, to access the compass and the accelerometer and your contacts and things like this. But other than that, it simply just downloads your app it makes your, your web app downloadable to your mobile device. Um, so you need to take the next step and theme your web app to look like a mobile app. Um, and you don't want to do that from scratch. It's going to be wasted effort. This has been done time and time again, so it would be reinventing the wheel. So there's all these web frameworks out there that are meant for making your mobile app look and feel like an, a native mobile device, uh, a native mobile app per the device, rather than just a responsive, web-friendly website. The most common, kind of like, the, the biggest known example is jQuery Mobile. This is kind of like, I don't, I don't know a lot of people beginning with jQuery Mobile these days. It's a little bit antiquated. It kind of looks like iPhone 1. But um, the way it works is it gives you a header and a footer um, and like a proper HTML structure and CSS classes to use so that your app looks native-ish. Um, and it gives you like buttons that look like mobile buttons. You click it, slides this new, f this new frame in, and all these things. Um, <clears throat> so the pros of using a mobile UI framework, you get UI and theming out of the box, um, and a whole bunch of widgets. Uh, and these are, I'll show you these when we get to the Ionic stuff, but they're things like uh, modal, modal dialogues and like a swipe left, swipe right um, Side, side menu that you'd see in a lot of Android apps, stuff like this. The other reason you want to use a mobile UI framework is, and this is a, this is a big one, it's kind of, um, you don't realize this until you get into the nitty gritty of mobile, of uh, HTML5 based mobile app development. There's all these uh, weird issues that you start to bump into. One, one, of the, one of the biggest examples is this 300 millisecond click delay on links in, in, in mobile apps. Um, or in HTML5 based mobile apps. If you go on the web and you click a link on a website, it waits 300 milliseconds to determine whether or not uh, uh, you're going to then perform another click to register a, a double click. And if after 300 milliseconds you didn't click again, that's a single click. So what happens is you click a link, it waits 300 milliseconds, and then it takes you to that, to that link. Um, but if, you, if, if your mobile web app um, waits 300 milliseconds for every single click, every single tap to perform the action, it's just going to look like lag to the user. It's just going to look like you have a slow app. So the way people get around this is that they manually override the 300 millisecond click delay. All these old jQuery mobile apps, there's this like boilerplate stack overflow code that everyone would use as kind of like the canonical 300 millisecond click delay override, and you just copy and paste that into your code. But if you use a mobile UI framework, this is all handled for you automatically, and you wouldn't even have to know that there was this 300 millisecond click delay issue in the first place. And that's one of many. Another example is um, scrolling is extremely slow on web apps. For one reason or another, it's just really clunky. And it doesn't have this kind of, you can't throw it, like on native Android and iPhone apps, you can't like throw the scroll, and you know how it kind of has this acceleration and it slows down. Um, 
So the way that people get around this is kind of like these old IE6 CSS hacks days. Like, you know, those star thing, the weird things that people put into CSS um, files. Uh, the, the way in this case of handling scrolling is they offload the scrolling into the GPU of the mobile device via a CSS trick that does this 3D transformation. I, I don't remember what the CSS looks like, but it's like scroll, you know, like scroll X is 3D transform, blah, 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 blah. And you would never think to do this um, until you realize, like you start Googling, why is my app so slow when I scroll? And then somebody gives you a Stack Overflow code boilerplate that you paste in. Is it overriding the actual container and then it's doing No, it's just, just the, the, I don't know actually. I mean, it's not, it's not for the entire app, it's just for the, uh, the containing div with the list items. Um, but I'm not, I'm not sure the answer to that question. Just the I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I'll, I'll look that up later and we'll throw it into the notes. It's okay. I've actually got a lot of time after this presentation, so fill it with questions. If anybody has questions, interrupt me at any point. <coughs> other things that these uh, mobile UI frameworks provide are like other optimized CSS <coughs> components, as well as like animations and stuff like these. So there is no reason you should custom design your your mobile web app when using PhoneGap, you should use a mobile UI framework. A lot of the, the, when people, when I say that to people, they're like, oh, but what about having like my custom theme? I wanna have a custom branded mobile app. Well, yes, you, of course you can theme these um, mobile UI framework based um, things with uh, custom CSS. So the biggest contenders in the mobile UI framework space, um, the oldies are jQuery Mobile is like probably the oldest and best known. Um, Sencha, I, I think that, um, does anybody do Sencha here? I feel like I met some Sentry users at the old at the AngularJS uh, meetup. Kendo UI. <clears throat> the other, the, the, the more modern ones. <laughs> Topcoat was developed by um, Adobe, and Adobe are Adobe's the people in charge of PhoneGap. So you'd think it would be kind of like the sanctioned mobile UI framework for PhoneGap. It's actually it's not that great. It's this very minimal minimal CSS framework. We actually used it for the previous incarnation of Habit RPG's mobile app. Um, it's got a little bit of uh, performance issues, and it doesn't really give you a lot of widgets out of the box. It's kind of like a starter kit for, for this space. If you want something a little bit more powerful, I'd, I'd move on to the next three. Um, AppGyver Steroids, I haven't looked into too much. It's kind of a funky name. They're going to have to change that eventually. It was just like the testacular for Angular. Um, I haven't looked into this, but I, I would recommend investigating. <clears throat> the second best, in my opinion, is Ratchet. Um, and Ratchet looks really cool. We actually played with it a little bit. We liked it. Um, and it originally was meant only for iPhone, and then they finally added uh, Android support. I think they might have Windows Phone, I'm not sure. But it's got a lot of really cool components, and it's pretty good performance, and it's really slick. Um, so I'd recommend uh, investigating that if you're interested in this space. Um, but we went with Ionic um, for a number of reasons, which I'll get into here. Number one is it seems to have, at present, the biggest the most amount of mind share and steam going behind it. I'm seeing, I'm seeing it everywhere now. It is really picking up fast. <clears throat> I think it's primarily because it's AngularJS based and AngularJS is kind of like the most popular front end uh, MVC it seems at present. Um, another cool thing is it has direct phone gap integration, which is very, very new for these mobile UI frameworks. I haven't seen this before in the past. Um, one example of this is they have platform detection. So it just uses Cordova's um, device plugin in order to tell you through Ionic as, as a, um, uh, what do you call it, dependency injection. It, 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 it has available as dependency injection, like just, uh, dollar Ionic um, platform. And then you can use that to determine whether you're on iOS or Android. And then it has this whole suite of uh, theme of uh, theme overrides per device <clears throat> that you can use if you want. So it gives you a bunch of defaults. 
Um, and they look great on any mobile device. And then if you want it to look more iPhone, more iPhone-ish on iPhones, you can use this platform detection uh, through Cord the Cordova plugin to, to um, use the iPhone-based theme set, like custom icons. And then it has a whole bunch of other ones through something called NG Cordova, which is a suite of phone gap extensions. Um, another, uh, another example is keyboard handling. Um, I can't remember which is the correct way or which is the incorrect way, but on, um, in hybrid apps, uh, when you click on a, um, an input element, it will bring up the keyboard, and it will either squish the app to make way for the keyboard, it, or it will overlay the keyboard on top of the app. One is the correct way, and one is the incorrect way, at least, in the court, at least compared to how native apps handle it. And so it gives you capability of, use, of using kind of the correct way through its... Um, through its own NG Cordova phone gap extension, which is pretty slick. And then finally, the biggest reason we chose Ionic over Ratchet was it's AngularJS based. And this allowed us to gut, take giant chunks of our AngularJS code from the web client, put it into the common library, and get all of that stuff for free on the mobile app. So we're able to share a lot more code and talent across the repositories. Um, it's also really, it's really nice that it uses AngularJS, it uses Angular UI Router so that you can, when you're switching between tabs um, and menu links, it'll do like lazy, lazy loading of the templates and all these things. So you get a lot of stuff for free through its router. It's really nice. And then we switched from Top Coat, which I was talking about previously, to Ionic. Uh, our major re recent release was just that switch. We changed the HTML structure to, to be in accordance with Ionic. We um, changed the CSS classes, deleted the top coat dependency, added the Ionic dependency, and that was it. Just switched to Ionic, nothing else. Same CSS, you know, everything's the same. Pushed the update, and, we, and then we announced it on Twitter. And we went overnight from a two-star rating to a 4.5-star rating. So that change in rating was exactly because of Ionic. So that's, I think that's a pretty good um, reason to, to look into that framework. So, without further ado, Ionic. Um, <clears throat> like I said, it, um, it has widgets. So, okay, so it has the, the theming, UI and theming component, and then it has the widgets component. And these are separated in the, in, the, uh, in the documentation of Ionic by CSS and JavaScript. So I'm just gonna go through a few of these really quick to show you kind of what it offers. So, um, Header, header content footer, of course. <clears throat> um, buttons. So as you can see, it's kind of like um, the, the iPhone, the, the latest iPhone version, kind of HTML5-ish looking flat buttons. So this is just the theming. You can have icons in your buttons. So up here on the top left, um, this thing normally you'll see in a bit will pull out the sidebar menu. Um, lists are there. Lists are kind of like their biggest, um, the biggest feature of Ionic. Let me see, I don't know where this thing is. Where is it, icons? There we go, buttons, icons. <clears throat> so the, the, their lists feature is a really powerful component. This is only the theming piece here. I'll show you the actual like functional piece of lists in a bit here. But it's really nice, it gives you kind of like um, left and right justification of all these things, like you get badges and notifications and icons and stuff like this. Um, uh, form theming for input elements and, and all these things, toggle buttons. Um, so it handles radios, checkboxes, etc., and themes it to make uh, per, per the, the way the device would normally theme these things. Um, little ranges, it's its own kind of HTML uh, element. Um, and then it has like proper, uh, this website is acting up, proper uh, grid layouts, a la kind of like bootstrap-ish stuff. And then the more interesting piece is the widgets that it provides. So <clears throat> tabs, you can have um, icon or text-based tabs, side menu, so um, you can use the button on the top left, it'll bring out the side menu, or it also has, uh, Ionic has um, swipe, swipe and tap handling. 
So I think it uses a Hammer.js, a library similar to Hammer.js. It's like a minimal version that they've integrated directly into their framework for handling swiping, swipe directives. Um, the navigation is one of the more complicated components of their framework. It's really cool, actually. Um, <clears throat> it uses Angular UI Router so that you can provide hierarchical-based navigation in the, in the app. And then, you know, of course, you tie templates to it and stuff, so it does lazy loading of rendering and all these things. But one of the cool things is because it's hierarchical-based, so I'm in the About section right here, the About tab. When I click this Tabs Nav Stack, it knows that I'm one level deep in the navigation, and it automatically adds this Back button, which you see in, in um, Android apps. And there's nothing you have to do to provide this functionality. It just automatically handles it for you. Um, and if I click Home, it will take away that Back button because it's now out of the stack which we had previously coded in top code ourselves custom in order for handling back button and detecting where you are in the app. And it's really nice to have that stuff out of the box. <clears throat> um, it has this little swipe down refresher that you, you get in a lot of apps, kind of like swipe, swipe list down, you get that loading bar. <clears throat> it has infinite scroll. Um, so you can use HTTP requests to determine whether or not to load the next page if you're, so that you save for performance because uh, mobile apps on, or, uh, web apps on mobile devices, performance is really of the essence. You, wanna, you really want to um, uh, split hairs as much as you can with performance on, on mobile apps. And one of the big, biggest places people fail here is by loading all of the items in a list into HTML at once. And so um, what they'll end up doing, typically I've seen, is they'll load in a third-party library for infinite scroll via HTTP, um, but this has it built into the framework automatically. Another one that you can use is this thing called collection repeat. And instead of using it, uh, instead of requiring infinite, uh, like a load next function based on where you are on the list or, and or HTTP requests, it will just determine what is visible in the list on your screen and not load the next section into the list until it knows that that's coming up. So you can load thousands and thousands and thousands of items into the collection repeat directive and not care about whether or not they're being loaded, uh, lazy loaded, because it handles that automatically. So lists I mentioned are one of the uh, most powerful components of, of Ionic. <clears throat> like I said, it has, it has the whole 3D transform for, for performance scrolling. But it also has a bunch of fun, uh, features available to it. If you swipe left on a list item, you get this, um, the, these like uh, action action items. Um, it has reordering. It has like this delete button that you can pull out and get these delete uh, delete buttons. And it has a whole bunch more. But those are those are just some examples. If you're building a photo app, um, it has this slide box. You can swipe between full screen large items. Uh, modal dialogs, action sheets are the, uh, action sheets are like if you click on an item you get this list of, this modal of actionable items. Um, and a whole bunch more. So right now Ionic is only on 1.0 beta 6 and every time they release a beta, which is, I've seen it as like once every one or two weeks, it's like it comes with a whole bunch of new features and capabilities like such that it's, it's very worthwhile keeping up with their blog posts. You just see a whole bunch of new features that are really slick. So it's got a lot of steam behind it. Bright future. Highly recommend it. Um, that's it. That's Ionic. Does anybody want to see, if, if anybody wants to see um, code, I can get into some of these and just show you like these, uh, the way they're structured in the JS component. Yeah, go for it. Well, on the one hand, I say I feel like I would recommend all mobile apps looking identical in a sense. Uh, they should have custom branding naturally, but one of the biggest problems with hybrid mobile app frameworks people complain about is it looks hybrid. It doesn't look like an Android app. Android apps have a specific look, and you want it to look like that. So you want it to accord with the UI spec of the framework of the of the device you're building to. So I. I Unlike Bootstrap, you want on, on the web on websites you want your branding to shine as much as possible, but on mobile apps you want to look like a native mobile app. 
However, there is still like um, a lot. It, there's a section in the documentation of Ionic for overriding theming for, pro, for for like a good branding experience. So definitely, you can bake in your own branding just with CSS overrides. Yeah, it has. Um, <clears throat> from what I understand, they, uh, let me see if I can find their, um, getting started in it. They, they have a section of the documentation about, um, CSSS. So, how to build custom, how to build uh, customize Ionic with SAS. So, like Bootstrap, it has a framework for overriding the, the components it assumes you would likely want to override. And it documents that whole thing in SAS. And so you have this one SAS file that goes into a particular directory that it looks for. And it, like, if you generate it, it'll, it will come with documentation on what things you want, you're very likely wanting to override. Um, so as far as I understand, it makes it pretty easy to um, override the theming experience. I'm not sure about like, the, the uh, CSS animation timing and stuff like that. So it's it's based on Cordova. Um, so uh, let me see. So you just go. You, you, so so it has a, it has documentation on how to compile it to the different devices and build the release files. So the APK file or the um, uh, I can't remember what the iPhone just dot app file is that what it is. Um, it has documentation on using the Cordova command line for compiling these to the various platforms. A lot of people just use PhoneGap Build, which is an Adobe service. You upload a zip file of your, of your web app into their service, and then it gives you a bunch of files. It gives you the, the distribution files that you use to upload into the, um, uh, the iTunes Connect and Google Play Store and stuff like that. Do they have the same No, all the testing. So you can use um, Ripple emulator if you want to test. It. No, <laughs> not a fan. The best way to test it is, is on the device. Yeah, in that case, the best way to test it is through Cordova, the command line utility. So Cordova is to phone. So Cordova is the engine that powers PhoneGap. PhoneGap is a wrapper on top of. It's kind of a distribution of Cordova, um, and uh, it's kind of like think of Cor what Cordova is to PhoneGap, what WebKit is to Chrome and Safari. And Cordova has a command line utility for building the apps, testing the apps, installing plugins and stuff. Eventually, if you're going to be building the app, like if you want to just play around with it, see what Ionic's all about, you just download it as a web app and you just load it as the index.html file and, and you, you, like it's very easy. If you want to look at how it would interact with devices capabilities, you can take the next easy step and install the Ripple emulator. But if you really want to see it on a phone, you got to get down and dirty and use Cordova, the command line utility. And then you can plug in your, your Android phone into your computer, and you say Cordova run, and it just brings up the app on your phone. Which is, once you get the system down, it's really fast. Um, it's just kind of that initial like one hour of setup stuff that's, that's a pain in the butt. <laughs> it was easier then though, like then debbing to Android, iOS, and Windows phone, you know, manually. Any other questions? So I understand these frameworks are really well on mobile phones, but how do you handle tablets or iPad or anything? Um, so I don't know that it that I, I don't know actually how it would look on a tablet. We we have so for Habit RPG we have like fifty thousand users and we have a lot a lot of them are tablet users and they they're like yeah it's fine you know like I. <laughs> I'm a, I'm a dumb developer. I don't even own a tablet, so I haven't actually tested it. Um, but like I've asked some of our users who are really good. They're like, yeah, it's fine, no problem. I don't, like, they showed me a screenshot once, and it, it looked kind of like a stretched out mobile app, so it wasn't the greatest experience. But I'm sure if you were like targeting that, you could handle it just fine with, with SAS overrides. And it's really just based on CSS, right? It's a responsive website, and you run it on a Yeah. How far would you 
to um, use ionic reflective desktop from I wouldn't recommend it. So <clears throat> we so here's what here's kind of what we did with Habit. We started on Bootstrap for the website, and then we and then everyone's like, we want a mobile app. So I was like, well, no, just use the mobile web. They're like, no, but we want offline access. I'm going to be ticking off tasks. You know, I, I brushed my teeth. I smoked a cigarette. Oh, no. On the go, maybe in the train or something like this. I want an offline app. Okay, fine. We'll just package the, um, the bootstrap website into PhoneGap as a downloadable application. We played with that, and it just didn't look, it look, didn't look great. Bootstrap 3 is designed for mobile devices. So it actually it looks and feels pretty good, but it doesn't look like a native experience whatsoever. Um, but like, you imagine taking Ionic and then kind of overriding some styles that are like obviously like hot. Yeah, I still wouldn't recommend. So, so yeah, so we went one way. You're recommending now. What about going the other direction? Start with Ionic because you're doing mobile first, and then I also want a, a website to to be the companion to the mobile app or something like that. If that's all you want is a, mo a website companion to the mobile app because the mobile app is your primary property, then yeah, it's doable. Like. Um, the, but the problem is the website will, f will look and feel like a mobile app. Overriding the CSS and JavaScript on, the, on Ionic so much so that it feels like a desktop experience I think will not be worth it. I think it would be preferable to have a, like a bootstrap website and a, an Ionic uh, mobile app. But, if, but like a lot of, a lot of, I've seen a lot of like mobile apps that you can use the website as a companion backend service like in a pinch kind of thing that end up using the same mobile code for their website and it's just fine because you're not going to be at like, oh, have that web tab uh, open like using it constantly. It works just fine, but it's just going to look like a mobile app and it wouldn't be worth all the time and effort overriding it to feel like a desktop experience. And we have our Bootstrap app and our Ionic app and we share a ton of code. So we, I, we use Jade and then I have a variable that says is mobile equals true in the in the like the index.jade file of the mobile app. And then in certain cases throughout the shared jade files, it will uh, it will render one thing or another. In most cases all it the only difference it needs is a different CSS class. Usually these frameworks are pretty smart about uh, proper HTML structure being compatible across different uh, frameworks. So a lot of times all we have to override is the CSS class. So I say is mobile is true or is mobile is false and I'm still able to to share a lot of the jade files. In fact, I'd say most. Most of the Jade files are shared between the devices. So we still get a lot of that reusability without get, having like a funky desktop slash mobile experience. What about um, PhoneGap? I looked into it a little while ago. There were some, there were some things that were not part of the PhoneGap framework and some native functionality. So I'm particularly thinking about one of the engineers that I have. So I wanted to do the app yeah. purchases. Those two specifically. So there's a third-party plugin for Cordova for both I, for ad, ads and in-app purchases. They're maintained by separate people, not sanctioned by PhoneGap, and they're and the iPhone and Android version of both modules are maintained by separate people. It's a pain in the butt. Um, so there's this new framework called um, whoops, it is called CocoonJS. And it has these things integrated directly. Um, it claims to have better performance than PhoneGap, and those two. So it says like we're going to add more features directly as part of the framework. It's a commercial product, so we're able to do this. Um, those two specifically, they have added initially because those are the most commonly requested things that aren't in PhoneGap. <clears throat> Again, like it doesn't matter what you use in the end because phone, both PhoneGap and Cocoon are simply just wrappers of your web apps to make them a downloadable package that adds some additional function, uh, native functionality. Um, so I would, for, in your specific instance, I would recommend looking into Cocoon. And in fact, I probably would recommend, I would recommend Cocoon to you instead of PhoneGap. So talking about performance, uh, do you know of any studies that have been I don't know. Um, I would I would just Google it, uh, like performance uh, hybrid versus native, but it's it is pretty noticeable. I mean, just think of it as like when you're browsing a web page versus using a native app, because that that's all it is. It's just it's just browsing a web page as an as a downloadable downloadable app. It doesn't add anything in the way of performance except for those mobile UI framework 
uh, overwrites, like I was talking about the 300 millisecond click delay and like the 3D, 3D transform scrolling and stuff like that. It adds these little CSS tweaks to make it feel better than a web page would, but still not by much, not by comparison to a native app. So um, on older devices, it's extremely noticeable. Anything Android 2.3 users give us a one star rating. They're like, this is so slow, like it works, I get things done on the go, fine, but like this is not a pleasant experience. And then anything Android like 3.0 and above, they're like, yeah, what? I don't know what people are talking about. What's wrong? So mobile newer devices are like, it's not that these frameworks are getting any better in the way of performance. It's that newer devices are getting so fast that you're more and more less able to notice the difference. No, somebody else mentioned that earlier. Um, famous framework. Here we go. Oh, I'm sorry. No, I haven't seen it. It's awesome. And the, the tutorials on it, uh, inside of there, it's, it's like code.org-ish like. It'll walk you through every single step oh, of the cool. process. You definitely need to check it out. It's awesome. Okay, I'll, I'll definitely check this out. Um, cause there's, Oh, cool. That's uh, that's what uh, Cocoon does also. Um, it's, it's similar to Cocoon. I, I don't think Cocoon actually... Cocoon does something a little bit differently, but yeah, same idea. Is it this right here? Yeah, awesome. cool. Isn't Cocoon targeted more towards games? Well, they use... the Yeah. Yeah, they, I, I think it's... Like, oh, it sounds like you might be able to speak yeah, that. Okay. So there was another one that's called Spray Until After Movie. Earlier, and what I like about it is it has the whole packaging and distribution stuff built in for you. So they have a sandbox app that you just download on your phone, and whenever you make a change in your app, you just um, hit a button and it pushes it through their build servers for free, and then um, pushes that to a link. You just go to that link on your phone and it loads it into the sandbox app. So That's you cool. Instantly test it, and for me, not having to deal with Android SDK, so that way Cordova can email stuff and get all that stuff. It is so much nicer because as a web guy, I suck at that. Gotcha. Phone gap build, yeah. Yeah, you just upload it. You don't have to do the same thing. You just upload it. And it, it gives you a QR code you can scan with your phone. It'll install the app on your phone. Yeah. 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 It's really straightforward. It's just got a splash screen. It's just checking for dependencies. So if anyone wants to link again to this, so I added every, the things that everybody mentioned. If you want to check them out, the link is tinyurl utahjsionic. I do it. And then lastly, I need work. If anybody has any contract opportunities, <laughs> any other questions? Cool, I think that's time actually. That turned out really good. Thanks, man. That's the first time.